The city of Grahamstown is in need of answers. Water, electricity, infrastructure and service delivery are all problems that don't seem to have a clear-cut solution. With the Makana municipality annually drained of financial resources, how bright could the future of Grahamstown be? We decided to start with the municipality. Our first question was what is the biggest challenge facing Makana? To find out, we spoke to Darren Holm, a DA ward councillor from Ward 12. Um, if a municipality is functioning as it should be and we are doing our role of oversight, then we should be financially stable. Okay. So yeah, we should be, but uh, we're not. And what would you say the leasing cause of that is? It's, it goes back quite a few years. Um, I've only been a councillor for just over a year now. But if you look at many of the reports that have come to council on cases of corruption and interference from politicians within the administration, you can see that a lot of the time people are serving their, so, their own interest, their self-interest. Mm. Infrastructure is the, the basis of any town. So when we talk about infrastructure, we talk about roads, we talk about electricity, water, sewerage. And as a local municipality, that is our basic aim, is to provide those basic services. But with that, infrastructure is our greatest cost as well. And in Makana municipality, we're currently facing a debt of over 130 million. And it has been an extreme challenge for us to manage our debt and with that manage our daily operations of infrastructure, for example. So we recognize the problem, but we also know that in order for us to, to solve this problem, it's important for us to have a financially stable municipality. I, I suppose it lead all back to corruption then, if, if we really go into this, because if they do have an understanding of this problem, and, and sure, I mean, it's their job to, right? It's their job to have the solutions, to have the answers, but they don't. Um, Local governments, especially in Makana, I would go as far to say that it's, it's very politicized. Um, a lot of what you do and how you do is informed by, by a higher structure or by someone else within a political system. So you're saying like so, you're supporting the DA sort of thing? Well, from, from, my, from my mandate, it's very clear what I'm supposed to do. But I'm saying at the end of the day, I am an opposition councillor. Yeah. So what recommendations we bring might not always be upheld because of some or other motive that someone else might have. Generally, I think we all want to see this, this town succeed. We all want to see it be financially uh, sustainable. We ultimately want to see uh, services being delivered to the people. Mm. But there is a lot of complexities in how the, how the council is run based on satisfaction of other political structures that inform the council on what to do. Our interview with Darren showed us that, much like their transparency, the municipality's plan for the future is not clear. With an unclear future, we started to think, what is the response from the community? We turned to Ayanda Korta, an activist for the Unemployed People's Movement. And uh, what is it you do, Ayanda? And I'm an activist of the Unemployed People's Movement. Okay, and what is, what is this movement? What does it do? Well, it's a social movement and, uh, of the unemployed. We are fighting for the assertion of our human dignity. Why has it been that uh, these programs have to exist? Well, because we are living in a structural unjust, radical unjust society. And I would remember South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world. Second. Yeah. Second, yes. And also the, the high levels of, in fact, unemployment has reached mm. alarming proportions. Mm. Uh, we are swimming in a sea of poverty, of unemployment, of inequalities. Mm. So we are, we are a broken people. Mm. So programs like this becomes a necessity. Aside from social movements, there are social organizations pushing for real change within the city. We speak to Philip McCallick, the chairperson of the Gramson Residents Association. Could you tell us about the association, what they do? Well, the association goes back a long way. I think it started in the 1980s, and up to a few years ago, it was fairly small, with around 50 members. And then uh, Tim Ball came to us with a plan to grow into a mass base so it could be more effective as a lobbying organisation and uh, to get real action on the real problems that face Grahamstown. More recently, been part of a coalition that has urged the provincial government to appoint a turnaround specialist to fix the major financial uh, and management problems of the municipality because uh, you know, for several years we've been going through 
this hiatus in having a proper municipal manager because the person who the municipality attempted to appoint was knocked back by the provincial government and has since been challenging it in court. So as I understand, since the Labour Relations Act makes it difficult to appoint temporary people for more than three months at a time, so we've been having this revolving door of municipal managers three months at a time who just have not had the capacity, time and long-term vision to be able to turn around these big problems. So groups like the GIA, do you think they help? They're doing significant work. Mm. They're doing marvellous work. Mm. Because they go into that council, they're doing a lot of research, they attend the council meetings, they sit in those council chambers, they sit in portfolio, in portfolio committees, and they provide us with, with such an important uh, uh, information. And, and you'd remember, no information, no right to speak. So I think GRA is, is, is playing a pivotal and political significant role and, uh, in, in our city. And, and it's a work that all of us we must be able to complement. Yes, I agree. Now I think, I know a lot of students, they, they, they don't know much about the GRA. They think it's a, a kind of a DA in disguise kind of thing. Well, what would you say to them? How would you, how would you reach across to them the importance of these social movements? Well, well I think it's because of they're not wearing any ideological cap. Uh, like your Ayanda, you know that that means black consciousness uh, or is a Marxist or descriptive uh, Marxist, whatever that you might call it to. I like the GRA, but I think if we have to judge them on those bases, we'll be making a huge, huge uh, mistake. We must be able to appreciate the kind of work that they are doing. It is an important work. It's a significant work. So I think we'll be, we'll be missing the boat if we look at them and say, they are right. They vote for DA. Mm. I think we'll be missing the point. Mm. Everyone who lives in Grahamstown is affected to some extent. If you own a car, driving over potholes is not good. If you get home and you find there's no water flowing out of the taps, that is also not good. If ESCOM carried out their threat to cut off electricity, also bad. But the people in the wealthier end of town who have the most capacity to complain are not the ones who are having it worst. You know, we have here are people living in the townships who are without water for months. We think that Rose the Bear this end of town tried driving out through there. So after speaking to Phil and Ayanda, we're now going to go to Mary Waters and we, we just want to find out more about these social programs. What are they doing? How are they getting involved? And, and where is the municipality in, in all of this? Yeah, so we're going to go speak to the principal now and see what she has to say. We are a no-fee school. Right? So the government gives us funding. For every learner, it's just over a thousand rand that we get. Schools like Mary Water seem to be in need of the most help from these social organizations. For the most part, there are efforts from the community, but more still needs to be done. Someone just mentioned now in our workshop, we are everything and it gets too much sometimes. We are nurses, we are social workers, we are psychologists and the list goes on. It's scary just to think of how these children come to school, most of them. How they come to school with so much on those little, young, small shoulders of them. And I know just interest can make a difference in their lives. Yet, despite these challenges, faith remains positive. I am very confident that it's just going to get better. Okay. Right? But... We need time to take the, to get there. On the whole, social programs seem to be helping Gramstown in a way that the municipality just can't. And while filming this documentary, we've got something we call the Mandela moment. A moment where we've realized that education is the most important focus of this country. This has been Justin Cronier, TV3 Journalism, Rhodes University.